All right. Um, let me go ahead and hit present on this bad boy and see if we can get this thing going. All right. So um, today we're going to wrap up the last half of World War I. Uh, World War One being a new kind of war we had talked about previously, with it being uh, sort of some, something that's totally unique in in, in uh, the history of warfare, regarding the way that uh, the war was fought and also the type of weapons that were used. So let's let's read through this together, okay? Um, World War One was a different type of war because there were many new ways of fighting. All right, you've got things like trench warfare, you've got machine guns. All right airplanes, submarines, and poison gas. So you've got a bunch of different types of uh, types of new technologies that are coming online here. And when you look at these images here uh, in the lower part of the screen, you see the trenches on the bottom right. You see machine guns. That particular one there is a water-cooled machine gun. And you see that belt that looks like it's coming out the side of it. That belt literally holds cartridges of ammunition. And those cartridges of ammunition are fed into the machine gun from left to right and fired. Uh, but no, excuse me, in this case, right to left. Um, there's a couple different kinds. There's Lewis guns, 1917 Brownings, a few different ones. This is a water-cooled one, though. You can see that big jacket of water around it that keeps the barrel from getting too hot. And then you notice these men are wearing um, gas masks, okay? And gas masks are there to help protect them from things like mustard gas. All right, mustard gas became a very popular thing to use um, against against your enemy in World War One, and it really started the to mainstream chemical warfare. All right, and then the bottom left, you'll notice um, a submarine there. Now that one, trying to recognize the nationality of that one, it looks like it might be British. Hard to tell, but there's a bunch of different um. Uh, of some you know different types of submarine warfare going on and what their main goal is is a little bit less sinking military vessels because that's kind of hard um battleships and um destroyers can sink a submarine too with things like depth charges but with um submarines you can easily sink cargo ships all right easily and if you don't have the materials you need to fight a war it's pretty hard to fight that war isn't it all right so um, let's keep going here. U.S. during World War One, uh, the British Navy was blockading Germany. Um, so once again, you got the military stepping up their game, and they're preventing the Germans from being able to get a lot of supplies in or out of their port. If you look at a map of Europe, you'll see that Germany kind of has this little North Sea little corner, and they're stuck in it, and they have to try and get out. Um, and, and, and they literally have to kind of get around the northern side of the United Kingdom. And, well, England has a pretty sizable navy. So that became a huge problem. So they responded with the policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare is exactly what it sounds like. No holds barred. We are um, sinking anything that comes our way that we can hit with a torpedo. All right. So Germany responded with that and they could sink any ship traveling across the Atlantic Ocean uh, And the submarines would even sometimes uh, work together, some, sometimes solo, different things like that. And then they would they would stop um, a lot of the shipping that was going over to um, uh, the United Kingdom uh, and France. All right. So all the support for them was being sunk and the German Navy was able to get out of their port a little bit with their massive use of that submarine warfare. Um a ship known as the Lusitania was hit by a German torpedo, and the ship went down. It sank um, not too far off the coast of England, and uh, there were 100 Mar Americans on board. And at this point in time, America was not in the war yet. Um, they were supporting uh, the British and the French, and uh, but they didn't... They hadn't engaged in war. We had not sent troops. Um, and then this sinking of the Lusitania really kind of solidified the call for American involvement in the war. Uh, and it made Americans much more willing to join in a war against, against Germany because of the sinking of this clearly unarmed passenger ship that happened to have American citizens on board. All right. And then here's another big one, y'all. The Zimmerman Telegraph. All right. 
what is this Zimmerman note? That's what you'll hear it called a lot is the Zimmerman note. That's what I would refer to it as. Um, the British intercepted a telegram from Germany to Mexico. Well, you guys know, where's Mexico? Our southern border. It's over here. It's in the Americas. Well, um, in this note, uh, Germany asked Mexico to help Germany uh, by invading the United States in exchange for territory. So this is what the Germans said. Uh, if you guys, okay, if you guys go and attack America and keep them busy and keep them out of Europe so we can win in Europe, then we'll let you keep your claim. We'll, once we're done fighting in Europe, we're going to come help you and keep your claims in Texas, Nevada, Me uh, New Mexico, California, and Arizona. So they were going to get a tremendous amount of land back that was lost by them uh, during what was called the Mexican Session back in the 1800s. And I'm, I know you guys remember us talking about that at some at some point. But they were going to get a, a big land grab out of this by supporting the Germans. At least that was the, the, the hope. Well, the British intelligence agencies intercepted the Zimmerman note. And when they intercepted the Zimmerman note, um, catching that alerted Amer the American people, hey, they sank the Lusitania, they're killing American citizens, and now they're trying to take our land? No. So we got to get involved. All right. So South Carolina, specifically during World War I, everyone in South Carolina helped in any way that they could. Okay. They signed up for the draft, um, which means that they enrolled into like a recall. Um, they bought war bonds, and buying war bonds is a way of buying a bond today. All right, it means that hopefully you'll get something more out of it later. So if I buy a fifty dollar, uh, excuse me, a one hundred dollar bond, and I spend fifty bucks on it, when it matures, it should be worth like a hundred bucks. That's just an example. Okay. And it's a way you invest in your own country. So in other words, hey, if I if I um uh, invest a little bit of money today. In the future, I'll be able to get more out of it because I'm investing in my own people, my own nation. Uh, so they signed up for the draft, bought the war bonds, and worked uh, to conserve food and fuel. So a lot of people were planting gardens and doing things like that. And you'll see this again, and it'll come around in World War II. But uh, basically, the whole country participated in, in, in making winning a war possible. Okay? Uh, segregation was still totally present. Um, that's racial segregation, talking about between uh, black, white, the idea there is that uh, people were still separate but equal. Okay, that was the that was the norm um, at this point in time. And anti-German feelings began to uh, develop a lot in South Carolina, and they even shut down the German newspaper in Charleston. So you have to think there's a lot of immigrants around um, different places in America, and those places kind of have their own little mini cultures, um, so to speak. Like even today in New York, you have a place called Chinatown. Um, and it's, you know, in little Italy, things like that. Well, that kind of stuff, hmm, became something to be looked at with more scrutiny, so to speak. Okay. So continuing on Fort Jackson, right over there in Columbia, which is still there today. It was built during world war one, the naval base in Charleston, um, at where I work and the base at Paris Island were expanded. Okay. So they already existed, but they were expanded and, um, their capacities were increased pretty dramatically. Uh, so let's see. Uh, la, 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 la. Farmers were helped by the increase in the price of crops. So um, ultimately, farmers did pretty well during this time period because there was a massive demand for food and stuff like that overseas and for the military. So farmers, man, they started uh, being able to produce and, and sell a lot of crops for a profit. So African-Americans migrated north for federal wartime job opportunities. And you kind of see this migration take place. Um, a lot of African-Americans began leaving South Carolina and moving up to places like Maryland, um, New York area, New Jersey. But and a lot of a lot of uh, African-Americans still live there to this day. So it became a very popular thing to move from the South to the North and, and search for these job opportunities. All right. So African-Americans specifically in World War I, let's look at them. While they served their country during the war, they came back to a racist South Carolina. And this is incredibly unfor unfortunate. Uh, you know, just like we say uh, in our class, there is no such thing as race. It's made up. It's not real. It's fictitious. Um, still stand by it but people were being judged simply based on the color of their skin or the tone of it, right? Because everyone truly is a shade of brown. Uh, but it's just, do you look different than me? If so, then we're, we're going to judge you, you know? It's kind of silly. But a convention was held in Charleston to pro protest Jim Crow. And you guys remember Jim Crow from last unit. 
where we talked about Jim Crow laws. And it was like these behavioral expectations and social distancing sort of type of thing between the two groups of people, black and white. So, um, yeah, they could do everything everybody else could, but do it over there. And it was that type of a deal. So in 1919, though, riots broke out in Charleston and three African-Americans were killed. So 1919, a little bit post-war, the war had just ended. Um, it's pretty fresh, though. But those African-American soldiers that had served and fought for their country um, and to liberate Europe now come home to some sort of, a, you know, homecoming where people don't really appreciate them, uh, even though they've clearly proved their value and worth. It's just it's very sad. Uh, you're going to see a map here. Europe before and after World War One, and you're going to see another one here. All right, you can utilize these as well as some stuff that's in your book or online resources. And I want you to do a, an assignment for me, okay? And that assignment uh, will be to label. You'll see it. It's a PowerPoint. I put it beneath this one when you go to the Google Classwork page and you look down. You'll see the Hawk Flight uh, slide, and then right beneath it, you'll see this one, and it's got a it's a classwork for 429 2020. And what it does is I've got uh, a blank map of Europe, right? And you'll see the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, all right? And those two power groups of, of countries, three piece, you'll see uh, the, each country listed. So three on this side, three on that side. I want you to drag and drop. I already put text boxes in there for you, and I made a copy for every single one of you. So what you do is you grab it and drag it to where that country is and drop that text box on top of it on the map. Once you've done that, you don't, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to save. You just click out of it and then submit it to me as done. It'll come to me. I'll get to see it and I can grade it. Okay. So your classwork's pretty cool. You're literally just labeling a map and I already wrote the, the country's names for you. All you have to do is uh, literally drag and drop. So um, hopefully that helps. Um, yeah, follow the instructions. Uh, don't forget attendance, Hawk Focus question, and uh, watch this video. Then, of course, if you're here, good. But after that, make sure you do the do the map labeling according to instructions. All right, guys. Um, really glad to be here. Hopefully, we'll maybe we'll do another Zoom meeting at some point soon uh, as we kind of figure out how the rest of the year is going to play out for us. Um, yeah, y'all take care. Uh, and it was good, good talking to you. All right, guys. Bye.